just to pick up on uh, Sarah Thornton's um, Sarah Thornton's comments about the uh, the very soft soft launch of uh, of our documents. Uh, I, I will flag two documents that were launched uh, to coincide with the Excellence in Policing Conference at uh, Wrighton last week. The first is the Fair Cop, which is the, uh, the study on legitimacy, and the second was an observational study of response and neighbourhood officers. Uh, it was uh, intended to pick up some of the themes of Diary of a Police Officer, which uh, many of you will remember with affection. Uh, both of them are really good bits of work. Uh, both of them uh, are credible uh, contributions to the body of research that's out there to aid our understanding, both of them available on the MPIA website. Um, it was, uh, as ever for me this morning, a, 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 an enjoyable morning tinged with apprehension. Uh, apprehension because uh, I was being spoken to by my former boss, Chief Constable Sarah Thornton, um, and uh, I can never forget those times when at Thames Valley Police Headquarters in our Chief Officer Team meetings, she would uh, look over her glasses at me and, uh, and, and strike fear into me. Uh, and also Shami Chakrabarti, uh, who I debated the questions of privacy and security with at the ACPO conference two years ago in, uh, in Northamptonshire. And Keith Bristow was chairing the session and she was dealing with a particular point from the audience and making a, a, a point quite emphatically. And Bristow looked over to me as, uh, to, to give me a little nod to say, do you, want to, do you want to talk on this point? And I gave him a tiny little shake of the head as to say, no, not, not on this one, Keith. And she thought I was disagreeing with her. <laughs> she turned around and harangued me. So, <laughs> so uh, in, in the light of that, I therefore went and completely re rewrote my speech for this afternoon. Uh, it'll be part response to what's been said earlier on, part analysis of what's been said earlier on, and part what I was going to, uh, going to say in any event. Um, but I should start by saying a point that came out in, in questions this morning. Uh, we are, as a police service, building on remarkable success, you know, remarkable reductions in crime, an outstanding rollout of neighbourhood policing, and already substantial improvements that chief constables have made in respect of uh, their cost effectiveness and their efficiency. Uh, but of course the challenge is changing and so must we. So I'm going to spend about 20 minutes now uh, doing, I hope, five things. I'll update you a little bit on what's happening on the national landscape, but we'll endeavour not to steal the Minister's thunder. Um, part of what's happening on the national landscape is the Police and Crime Commissioner, so I'll just be exploring a little bit of what's in there in tray. Um, I'll explore again a little bit of what isn't in there in tray, but perhaps should be. I'll explore the question that arose this morning that, that intrigues me about what's really new and what's just a, an old challenge with a new flavour. And finally, about how policing might need to change. And in each of those, rather than just regale you with a long list, I'll focus on a couple of is issues that are of interest to me in the hope that they'll be an issue uh, uh, of interest to you. Um, and on the first of those questions then, the national landscape, just a, just a quick recap. A couple of years ago, we were spending £698 billion a year as a nation, and we had receipts of around £548 billion. That left a gap, and when you don't pay off the gap in year, you build it, build it up. Uh, I tried that economic model at the University of Leicester in the late 1980s and found that there inevitably comes a day of reckoning, and we are all living with that reckoning. And of the 14 billion we spend on policing, around 9 billion comes from central grants, and it's about a fifth of that that's been lopped off, and we need to find it. Um, that's one of the big issues confronting the new administration, and I'm sure the minister will go into more detail about it. Um, and then the second uh, change on the new landscape that I notice is the principle that we shall just do more at a local level uh, whilst protecting against strategic threats and taking strategic opportunities. That means the development of a national crime agency. We look forward to uh, seeing the leadership of that uh, crime agency taking shape soon, but I think the actual format of the agency is becoming increasingly clear. The other big change on the national landscape is the NPIA, and I should say now, as I tend to say when talking about the NPIA, um, the people of the NPIA have responded fantastically to what was unsurprisingly difficult news about it being phased out, and every corner of the agency has upped its game. Uh, the performance of the agency around IT is improving. We have happier students on our courses, our programmes, whether that's the Crime Mapper or the Police National Database, continue to be delivered increasingly on time and increasingly to budget. Morale in the agency is good. In February of last year, we asked our people, 
are you proud of the, uh, of the work we do at the MPIA? And 60% of them said yes. We asked them again in April of this year, sometime after the phase-out had been announced, and 82% said yes. And we asked them again last month, and 85% said yes. These are really good public servants, very proud of their public service, very proud of the contribution that they make to making communities safer through policing. And I've got uh, nothing, uh, nothing but praise for them. You hear some noise about the pace of change, and uh, of course we all welcome clarification when it comes, but uh, you shouldn't underestimate the extent to which these people are making change happen as we speak. The headcount of the agency is already down by a quarter. Um, the non-ICT procurement of NPIA will this week pass over to the Home Office. The National Senior Careers Advisory Service has already been shut down. The closure of our site at Harrogate has already been announced. We've already got out of New Kingsbeam House on the banks of the Thames, awful office, lovely views, and we've also brought in consultants to help us explore options for the disposal, disposal of Brams Hill, that beautiful but uh, terribly expensive Jacobean mansion in the Hampshire countryside, which has a bill to keep English heritage happy of around 29 million quid. Um, but as we do this, and, and I think the service has, uh, has concentrated more on what we don't know about transition than what is happening about transition, I think we need to pay more attention and ACPO and colleagues in the service need to pay more attention to this phase out because these functions, when they're gone, they're gone. And the budget trajectory downward is pretty steep. If you assume we make no efficiency gains, then the gap between what we do and the cash we'll have at the end of the spending review period is around £86 million. Um, and there's only three ways we can respond to that. We can either stop doing things, we can either do them more efficiently, or we can get people, namely police forces, to pay for them. And I think this community should be prompting chief officers and ACPO colleagues to say, what is going to happen about research? What is going to happen about authorised professional practice? What is going to happen around cost effectiveness support to forces? And what is going to happen around forensics and other similar functions? Because it is in increasingly the service's responsibility to be self-sufficient in that regard. Um, so what's in the, the PCC's in-tray? Um, I guess first and foremost, um, there's, the, there's the question of re-election from day one. So when people like Shami Chakrabarti stand up here and talk about an X Factor style vote for who gets arrested this week, you look around the audience to see people writing down saying, now there's a manifesto promise I could make, but please don't. Um, PCCs also have on their intro cutting crime. Um, they will inevitably, I say no, but repeat the challenges of spending review, but they do have the challenges of managing with rather less. Uh, they may, or indeed may not, choose to build a network or infrastructure for PCCs to give them a coherent national voice. Um, and they may also feel pressure to cope with everybody else's cuts. One chief constable friend of mine was describing a session that he ran where he brought f fellow leaders from the local authority and health and others together in a session that was moderated by university vice chancellors, lord lieutenants and other dignitaries. And each, each public body that was operating in that locality explained what it was going to do to cope with the challenges posed by the spending review. And um, each of them gave an explanation that focused very much on the needs of their own agency. And the feedback from the Pro Vice Chancellors and dignitaries was, it sounds like you're all ensuring organisational risk management and you're all looking after the needs of your own organisation. But what seems to be missing here is your thinking about the community and the space between your organisations. So as you contract, gaps appear between you. And unless you radically alter your thinking, the organisational preservation will take precedence over the preservation of community safety and that will create risk. Um, and the other thing that uh, PCCs may well choose to do, which uh, I think picks up on one of Shami Chakrabarti's themes from this morning, is to try and manage the growth in the scope of policing, um, the mission of policing. Um, I was uh, slightly surprised the other day to uh, a symptom of this. Uh, I follow the tweets of a local uh, beat officer for the university and uh, he was tweeting how he was on his way down to Heathrow Airport to welcome some international students to the country. 
And I thought to myself, now there is that's stretching the police mission to uh, to a point that I would uh, not have expected it to see stretched to. So a, a busy agenda for PCCs, and of course in that list of mine, um, which doesn't pretend to be comprehensive, cutting crime will of course be um, central. A couple of things that I think are not in the intray that I think perhaps should be, and the first of them is the cyber e-crime threat. We heard quite a bit about it from speakers this morning and uh, I, I'm very struck. I'd, I'd commend to you the writing of Misha Glenny, a former reporter, uh, author of uh, I think McMafia and um, now very interested in, in cyber crime uh, and whether it's out of control. He, he was writing last week in the, in the Guardian, rather his book was reviewed in the Guardian last week and uh, he describes a talk he gave to FIS which was an American financial institution and he was telling them all about how a gang of hackers had hacked into the mainframe of a bank that was selling prepaid credit cards. So you have a credit card that has a spending limit, so it's like a, it's like a gift voucher card and it's good for people that with, uh, with relatively low credit ratings. And these criminals were buying bulk prepaid credit cards with a limit of $15, hacking into the, uh, into the bank's system raising the credit limit from $15 to something rather higher, and then taking, uh, in this case, around £640,000 out of the affected bank's cash machines all around the world in the course of one weekend. And it's just symptomatic. The, the, he, the reason he tells that story is that he was telling this particular organisation about that threat and didn't get the audience reaction that he wanted at all. In fact, they, they looked rather gloomy when hearing the story. It was only three weeks later that he discovered that the bank had actually been itself hit in precisely the same way, but that it hadn't leaked out at the time of, uh, of his presentation. And I just think there is something about this threat. It, it has a language all of its own. You, you must know what a CADA is or escrow or um, scareware or botnets, all, uh, all a language of its own. Escrow, by the way, is, uh, is an inter internet uh, criminal version of PayPal. If you don't know what PayPal is, then, then you really do have some catching up to do. Uh, the, the other thing that um, Glennie says is that uh, you hear the estimates. Sarah Thornton this morning gave us an estimate of 27 billion per annum in, uh, in the UK. Glennie quotes the US government estimating 640 billion per annum. But what it actually says is none of us know. Many of the banks and financial institutions actually never discover the extent to which they've been hit. Um, the second phenomenon that I think isn't featuring or is not featuring sufficiently on uh, PCC's intrays is the question of social media. Uh, 750 million Facebook users worldwide, 30 million of them are in the UK, that's about half the population. And Twitter uh, welcomes 400,000 uh, new users each day. I'm a big fan of uh, social media but uh, it's not without risks risks to organisations in terms of intellectual property um, and security. It presents a criminal opportunity and uh, worryingly too, we just don't know who's talking to our kids. And worse still, our kids don't know who's talking to our kids. And I think there's, a, there's some common characteristics around this kind of, this not on the intray threat. Um, we're scared of it because it's technological, it's moving really quickly, it works well with mobility of people, and it also reflects changes in people's attitudes to authority um, and the com coming together of those things uh, to which our return is, uh, is a little scary. It brings us, I think, to this third question of mine. Uh, so what's new and, sorry, my fourth question, what's new and, uh, and what's old? Tony Bottoms gave us the question this morning, the past is a very good guide to the future. And then he said, no, it wasn't. And he cited the example of the fridge. Yep, he's right. I had a girlfriend in the 1980s whose dad was a typewriter repairer and I'm sure as he saw his business uh, fall over in the following few years, he'd agree as well. But nevertheless, actually the, the past can be a great help in predicting the future. Um, not much changes around crime, the stealing, the stealing with force and we call that robbery, the stealing with the, in the, with the involvement of the victim and we call that fraud and then there's bullying, and then there's other sorts of violence, and they don't change. And in terms of the past being a predictor of the future, we could collectively, a group of us, walk into a primary school, 
round the corner from here, within a few miles of here, on us getting the answers to uh, five, ten questions, we could probably predict which of the kids in that school is most likely to spend their, uh, spend their um, 21st birthday in prison. And, and similarly, in terms of what goes around, comes around, 26 years ago today, the police in London shot somebody called Cherry Gross. It sparked three days of rioting and that same old discussion of underclass and societal breakdown. But in all this what goes around comes around world, I'd point to two things that I think are genuinely new in terms of the criminal threat. And the first is the implications of technology around our traditional sense of a safe place. Your kids can be bullied in their bedroom, in a way that wasn't previously, uh, wasn't previously possible. And we are vulnerable to criminals operating out of Estonia, out of Nigeria, out of South America, in a way that we weren't previously. And the second is, I think, the implications of technology for our ability to authenticate, whether that's about fake goods, counterfeit currency, email scams, fake websites, or hacked systems. There's something about what we can and can't take for fa at face value anymore. And I think that needs to feature in our thinking as we, uh, as we design a response to the challenges of, uh, of this new age. And we should be particularly attentive, I think. I, think. I draw, had I a, a flip chart here, I draw a Boston box, because no uh, senior police officer presentation is complete without either a Boston box or a declaration that policing is at a crossroads. Um, and in the uh, Boston box I'd have along the bottom saying what's, what's just old stuff with a new flavour and what's genuinely new. And up the y-axis I'd have what's in view of the PCCs and what's not yet in view. And it's that kind of top corner up here of the stuff that's genuinely new and not yet receiving attention that we should worry about. And I repeat the characteristics there. I think this is stuff which is associated with technical advance. It's changing quickly. It's a mobile threat and is reflective on, of a new attitude towards authority. So how's policing going to have to change to deal with these and the other new threats? Um, I'll say again, I think policing has been extraordinarily successful um, and uh, it needs to build on many successes but uh, adapt to change. Um, well, I talked to the superintendents the other week and um, we were discussing the question of direct entry and um, I think that's likely to become kind of one of the debates of this spring. Uh, and in pressing the case in support of direct entry into the senior ranks of policing, or at least for a fresh approach to that, I premised my, uh, my argument on the fact that I think in the future we will need to be more outward facing and more commercially aware. On the commercial issues, I've been very fortunate to do the job that I've been doing in the last 12 months. Um, I've seen uh, 100 suppliers this year, and in my contact with them, I've learned about our markets as it looks from the outside. I've sat down with Bill Crothers, the commercial director of the Home Office, and we've had face-to-face, hard-nosed discussions with the leading suppliers to policing, talking about their margins, their pricing, their future pipeline, their cost of sale, and I've learned a great deal about the bad deals that we've struck in policing. And I've also learned a great deal about what a dysfunctional market policing is. And I think we need to open up our leaders' thinking to that and learn a new skill set. In terms of introspection, I reflect on a service with its own language, culture and traditions. We lack ethnic and gender diversity, that's true, but we also lack a diversity of thinking and a diversity of skills. And with the superintendents, I, I sat on a panel described, uh, described by a, a, a Home Office director as being the, akin to Old Trafford away and said that uh, I thought we should change our approach to populating the senior ranks of policing. And we'll just, uh, we'll just rehearse some of those arguments now because I do think this will become the argument of the winter about what comes next in police reform and know that uh, Tom Windsor is very engaged in it. Um, firstly, I wouldn't say that a produce manager from Sainsbury's down the road could walk into a superintendent's role tomorrow. And I think th this debate is rather less polarised than people would have you believe. I think we all think that people need to gain proper operational practical experience. It's just the way, and the, the way in which they do it and the time for which they do it. Um, but I do think that the time has come to shift the burden of proof 180 degrees 
And as the service has been successful in arguing that it's for others to prove that direct entry can work, I think the time's come for police leaders to prove that it can't. Um, listen to how it sounds. Which of these arguments would you want most closely to be associated with? On the one hand, you have the argument that says, the best candidate will always, always be homegrown, or the person who says, we want to, uh, we want to employ the best, uh, the best candidate and just we'll find the person who's best for the job. And the problem with the philosophy that says the best candidate will always, always be homegrown is that it just sounds a bit like protectionism. And if you look at what we have now, it just sounds rather more protectionist than I'm comfortable with. We have a system that says if a chief constable wants to promote a superintendent, let's take the, the force that we're in at the minute, the City of London Police, 1,200 officers, probably six to 800 police staff. If you want to promote a superintendent from within the ranks of that, the chief's choice is probably effectively limited to half a dozen people rather than the breadth of the organisation. We have a system where in most forces, half of the workforce have a meaningful career structure and the other, far, the other half has very little indeed. And where tens of thousands of people in policing reach a career dead end within their first decade of joining and have nowhere left to go. We have a system where we struggle to respond to the changing nature of our communities. Progression for those from minority backgrounds is far slower than it needs to be because the only entry points are probation or training and promotion through the ranks. A big problem is that our system means that changes we make to the raw material of our workforce will work their way through to the most senior positions in two or three decades' time. A system where we talk about operational credibility being the justification for this protectionism, and yet we don't actually define it, nor indeed do we insist on it. So it's far from unusual for us to promote people to senior positions who've never commanded a firearms operation, or investigated a major crime, although they've generally done one or the other, albeit sometimes only once or twice. It's a system where the top people aren't actually doing anything like what the people on the front line are doing on a daily basis, but claim that commonality as a justification for being insulated from competition. And I think that's where Shami Chakrabarti's argument this morning where she compares our position with the position of surgeons falls down. The surgeons are still cutting people open, but we aren't. It's a system where the people at the bottom are so scathing about its distant leaders in ACPO, um, although that's obviously usually caveated by, with the honourable exception of the person they're talking to at the minute. And it's a system where we continue to tolerate people in middle management and senior management positions in whom we don't have full operational confidence. There are several other arguments, but I, sh I should just skip ahead in the interests of time to the last one, which I think is probably the most compelling of the lot, which is a system that closes the door to people typically aged over 30. Anyone who's reached a position in their career where they're earning between 30 and 35,000 pounds a year, it becomes economically unviable to take a step down to the bottom in order to join policing as a police officer. And thereby we close ourselves off to such a wealth of talent that might usefully make a contribution to policing. Who'd vote for a system like that? Um, well, we do, um, and I think that we need to move on to a situation where we have, uh, we do the same as excellent organisations of all shapes and sizes, public, private, charitable. They achieve diversity and they achieve flexibility by bringing new skills in and then allowing people to move on. So in summary, I've had Roger look at his watch. I'll skip to my last page. Um, I'm saying this is a changing landscape. It has many new opportunities and challenges. I'm saying that uh, police and crime commissioners will be arriving to find a full and demanding entry. I'm saying there are some immense issues that have yet fully to get into that entry and a predictable mix of genuinely new challenges and some which are as old as the hills. These are challenges that will require our already successful police service to change, to keep pace and to continue to improve. But I personally have no doubt that it will be able to do so because I share the belief of Hugh Ward and many others that we have the best police service in the world. Thank you.